Hi, everybody. Recruiting Animal here on February 14th, 2024. We've got Tam, Tommy Pistachio Alashio. We've also got our good friend, Sasha Tasanovich. Okay, so here's the thing. Let's ta so start off with some warm ones. Okay, what about this? Uh, this candidate went out for a job interview, Tommy, and uh, after the interview, the interviewer was walking her out to the office, you know, to the exit, and one of the team members that they were interviewing for that team came up and introduced himself, and the interviewer gave a, a nod. No, no, she's not. And so the guy backed off. That. That's disgusting. <laughs> that is disgusting. Would you agree that with me? That is depressing and disgusting, 100% extremely unprofessional. But you know what? She's kind of like lucky that happened. At least she knows this company stinks. Something's wrong, wrong there. I mean, yeah. you're either in or out. I mean, it's like, whew, wow. And to have that so blatantly, like, you know, like, I would have turned and go, oh, I guess that answered my question. Don't worry. I'm not going to send you a follow-up email and turn around and walk out. Well, on the other hand, I, I read, don't burn any bridges. You never know. So you don't want to get a, you don't want to insult these idiots either because they, they can hurt you at perhaps if I were to That's That's actually a very good point. And not like only that, when I was, when I was reading that article, I remembered what you taught me just a few weeks ago. You can't get angry. You yeah, can't money's get better angry. than ego and you can't get angry. You're right. Yeah. It's yeah, not but personal. It's, it's hard sometimes. What that, that was disgusting with that with that interview. Yeah, that was. That, I saw that and was I was like, man, like that's just really bad interview, uh, you know, etiquette and employer etiquette. I just, I mean, yeah, there's no reason for that. That that was that's bad. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I call. I labeled that crude candidate experience. Okay. Here's one. Uh, I don't know if you ever seen the movie uh, Treasure of Sierra Madre. They're they're looking for gold up in these hills in Mexico, and these bandits come. They want to rob them, so they're fighting them off. And the the chief bandit says, uh, "Oh, they claims they're coming from the police." And Humphrey Bogart or one of those guys say, well, "Show us your uh, badges." And he says, "We don't badges? need those stinking badges." Yeah, I love that. We don't need those stinking badges. And I always think of that when people talk about recruiters having to uh, be functionally experienced in the field that they are recruiting for. This one guy says, I applied for an engineering recruiter job 10 years ago, and I was told you'll never be able to recruit engineers if you're not an engineer yourself. He said, man, that guy was so wrong. And I know you agree with your recruiting engineers and, and you're far now from I'm idiot. It. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I have, I barely graduated high school and I recruit PhD engineers civil structural guys, you know, guys who have patents for designing clear span buildings, uh, guys that are way, way smarter than me in, in, in leaps and bounds. Okay. But let me challenge you on that. First of all, I'm looking at my own picture here. I look like a ghost and I was trying to adjust the coloring before the show starts. As soon as this, you know, I turn on record, I go pasty. Sorry, everybody. Make up. I don't. Look, yeah, I have to wear makeup. Look like a clown. I don't look like this in real life. I've got some uh, color in me. Okay. Okay. But hold on, Tommy. You always strike me as being a very intelligent person, and yet you go around bragging. I had trouble getting out of high school. What's happening there? If I had to talk, I talked to you many times here. I always think this is a smart guy. Is there different kinds of intelligence? What's going on? You're not an idiot. Okay. I mean, I use that because I, I didn't graduate college, right? So I, I, I'm smart in certain things, I guess I'm dumb in others, right? We all are like that, right? So it, it's kind of more of a tongue in cheek thing, right? I, I don't consider myself to be an idiot, but I use that as, as an example to tell people like, you know, you can do anything you put your mind to and it doesn't necessarily mean you had to graduate college. Now look, I could never be an engineer because I didn't go to college, but I can still talk to them on their level and I'm able to place them. So it's more of a like, Hey, if I can do it, you can do it. I'm an idiot. And if I can place engineers, so can you. Okay, so, yeah, how I do part, it's partly rhetorical, but not 100%. Maybe you don't have the uh, kind of intelligence that could get you a degree in engineering. No, I don't. I don't. I can't. That doesn't process for my brain, right? I've tried to go beyond geometry and math, and, and it's very difficult for my brain to process that. I don't have that type of brain. Okay, right, but so, communication skills or some other thing going on in there is working properly at a high exactly. level. <laughs> exactly. Okay. Okay. 
Uh, so maybe that's what they mean as well when they said someone interviews well, but when they get on the job, they're no good. I mean, it, it, they, you know, it, sometimes they say the person's on the uh, autistic spectrum, so they're not going to be good communicators, but but they can do a technical job on I their mean, own that, very well, I guess. Maybe that's what they're talking about. Well, yeah. I mean, when you're interviewing, you really have to look at all the aspects of the job. And, and just because someone has all the, the qualifications on paper, maybe he can do the basics of the job, but he necessarily can't do the entire job because there are soft skills um, that are required to do the job that's, that you don't see on paper, right? So that's where good interviewing comes into play and understanding how to talk to people and cultural fits and that type of stuff. Okay, so I've got I've got a posting about that as well. well hold on. Sasha has a question. Do you got a yes, question? I no, yeah, I ahead. actually would like to chime in. The thing is that uh, sometimes the company's culture doesn't set the proper training, right? So uh, th th there is a reason why we have in every company like 90 day uh, uh, the introductionary period where pretty much we're able to see if a person, specific person is going to merge in or not. So I stand behind uh, having a, a great uh, training material in order to be able to properly um, prepare the person for the job they're, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're going to do. Know, how, how can you hire somebody if you're telling them up front, you're on probation for three months? I mean, I wouldn't leave another job if I thought that they, you know, might fire me at any, any time. Uh, at the drop of a hat. Well, the thing is, Michael, you cannot, uh, you know, forecast based on or you know, uh, uh, decide based on three uh, the meetups with a person whether that person is a good fit for a company or not. Okay, so what's that? Uh, th there. And it's, so, uh, it's much easier for the companies when they have a, a policy of 90 days in production no, period. Short. As much as I complimented you before, I am going to cut you short. The two things are not Why? contrasted. Let's ask these other yeah. two guys. Would you be able to recruit someone if you said to them, look, I'm only hiring you for the probation. I'm not going to guarantee that you're getting past the first 90 days. We in the U.S., we don't have to worry about that because there is it's a right-to-work state. Um, and we have 90 day probationary periods. Every company has that, right? They could fire you for no reason in the first 90 days, right? So that's a U.S. thing that we don't even have to worry about. Yeah, but you know, it, it's not the like, if you're actually warning them, look, we're judging, we're looking over your shoulder and we are going to cut you. If I'm going to interrupt you. you. No one says that. No one says that. The thing is that that policy, that is the type of the policy that makes it easier for the companies from the legal side right uh nobody's going to tell you okay you're going to be hired but there is a possibility that we're going to term you in first 90 days okay Let everybody me... in the u.s knows that you have a 90 day probationary period they know that if you screw up in the first 90 days you're out the door i mean that's just a uh, that's like a common thing in the u.s that we've always i don't want to say common but not every american yeah, state plus there that. is in most in most of the states there is at will employment mm -hmm. meaning that Companies are pretty much able to term anyone without, or with or without a good cause, and vice versa. Yeah, the only thing they can't fire you for is the stuff that's under the, you know, the ADA and the civil rights and all that, right? You know, color, religion, yada yada yada. But if you're not doing a good job, they can out the door in the first ninety days, no questions asked. Not only if you're not doing a good job, we're talking about whether you like the person or yeah, or I mean, yeah, 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 like any, any reason, it does not matter. They okay. can. You know, let me segue into the next uh, the next thing. OK, this is I'm quoting Libby from HR. She posted on Twitter, but I'll preface it. You know how people are always saying, oh, you know, culture fit. We don't do culture fit. It's it's too open to bias and blah, 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 blah. Here's what Libby says. She said, what's the worst kind of employee? It's a high performer with a terrible attitude. They poison the environment for years because they're so good at what they do, it's hard to justify removing them. But watch things improve once they go. Okay. So you want to hire somebody who is going to be fun or pleasant to work with, even if they aren't at a, a to number 10 or nine in, in their technical field. I think that's fair. But if you say that, you know, people are going to accuse you of just bias. Am I right about that? Anybody agree with me? 
I mean, the the first part was right. You're, he's absolutely right. Or she, he or she is absolutely right. If you have a toxic employee that is a huge producer, let's let's call him a great recruiter, right? You're in a search firm, you have 10 employees, and one of your recruiters is billing $2 million, and he's an asshole. It's toxic for that, but you don't want to let him go because he's making you millions of dollars, right? That's a very difficult situation to be in. Um, and then to piggyback on that, you know, hiring people that are going to fit in culturally. And it, it doesn't mean that if you're a runner, all you hire is runners. It just means that you hire people that fit in, in, in this basic, like, you know, general culture. So we're not a giant family. We don't have to get along, but you also want to make sure that it's a, an environment where everyone is thriving. So there's nothing wrong with that. As long as you're not making it so discriminatory, you're only hiring you know, six foot tall, blonde haired, blue eyed men and women, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, that physical description is not uh, uh, appropriate. Gavin, who uh, used to come to the show regularly, very smart guy. We don't always agree with each other, but he said, look, here's what happened. My new client needs to fill a crucial role. I send in three candidates He and, and who's the one that he likes the best? The one I consider to be the weakest candidate right why does he want that candidate because they bonded over rugby <laughs> they bonded over rugby and and gavin says that was my own fault i failed to understand the culture i didn't know the hiring manager was crazy about rugby now i don't know if there was any way for gavin to know about rugby uh and i don't know he didn't say look i tried to talk to talk my client out of going with this guy but the hiring manager was really enthusiastic about rugby is that uh, a terrible hire what would you do if that was uh with your with your your guy so if they have the basic skills right so if you let's, let's call it an engineer and they all have the bachelor of science in civil engineering five years experience their pe and they've done the similar projects right but one maybe has 10 years experience the other guy's got an se right if they're hiring the guy that fits in better for their company even though he's he's the least of the three that's a good hire because you he's going to last longer. He's going to have a a, a, a more um, uh, want to be there, right? He's going to want to be at that company versus the other two who maybe don't. I've said this a hundred times. You've heard me say this, that my client hires on culture first and experience second, right? I could bring them a direct a guy from a direct competitor who's got 10 years experience and can knock it out of the park and can sit down and do work immediately but he's got a shitty non-company type attitude that they're looking for and bring him a young EIT who has no experience in their industry, who's a perfect fit culture, they're gonna hire the young EIT over the direct competitor 99% of the time. Okay, hold on, but what about just making, I don't know, they must have really liked each other, but rugby, rugby, <laughs> that's the- design. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it, was, it was probably more than that, but that was probably the catalyst that got the conversation going, right? It was probably more than just rugby, but it was the catalyst that said, this guy is a good fit for our company and these are the reasons why. Okay, what about this? Michael G. Cox, I think we all respect Michael G. Cox. He had a, a fight when he was internal with uh, one of the uh, VPs of sales. He was hiring salespeople. And this guy came out of baseball. I think he might've been a professional baseball player and he wanted people who'd come out of athletics, people he wanted athletes. Michael G. Cox said there's no uh, proof that someone coming out of uh, uh, you know an athletic team uh, is going to uh, hit quota or go over quota on a regular basis. So they came head to head on this. Mike said, I refuse to hire on your basis. Okay. Are you saying, so what you're saying now is kind of that Michael G. Cox was too narrow minded. Am I right about that? I agree. Mm -hmm. You I agree with he, him or that he made a mistake? I think Michael was too narrow-minded. I do. I think Michael was too narrow-minded that it, it, you're looking for, and again, I, you know, this is just my experience. I'm looking for skills that have done well in the past for my client, right? So if they have a lot of people who had NCAA Division I competitive sports backgrounds that excel in the sales roles, I'm going to bring those type of people to them. Now, there are other things in there besides just that, right? Degree, um, maybe they sold something when they were in college, they worked for, you know, 
Cutco and vector marketing, whatever the hell that's called, or whatever it is. There are other little things that I look for. But if, but if, this, like my Marines do really well with my client as well. So I look for guy ex Marines, right? Like if if I can find an ex Marine, I know he's going to fit in good culturally with them because he can he can do the Yale or jail, talk to anybody whether they graduated from Yale or just got out of jail, and he's got a leadership role. He understands how to deal with different types of you socio economic backgrounds, right? So I look for those things. It doesn't mean he's going to he's going to be perfect, but if he has that, it's a plus on top of the other stuff. Okay, here's a here's an interesting question. So these questions are fitting in. Criticize me, stop me if you don't like what I'm talking about. Okay, everybody, please feel free. But uh, to me, they seem to be fitting well today. I didn't expect it. This one guy said, I can't remember who said it. He said, when you're talking to people, uh, when you're you know doing candidate outreach, whether you're actually recruiting the person or not, I always ask them, how did you get hired here? And that's some really interesting into, insight into the person uh, himself or herself, and also the company they're working for, and maybe for the industry, maybe more broadly as well. I, I don't remember ever asking that. It's certainly not as a, a rule. If, you, what do you think about that? I think that's a great question. I've never asked either. That's a great question. I, I think, yeah, I think it is pretty interesting. Yeah, and I mean, that is a, a fantastic question that I'm going to add to my, uh, you know, uh, Toolbox. Right? Good question. That's a really good question. What was the question? What was the question again? How, How did, did you get, get hired here? Yeah. You call the person at company, you're recruiting for company X, you call them at company Y, and you say, how did you get hired here? And so you'll know what their strengths were that the company liked. You'll also, you might be doing work for that company or some other similar company in the future, and you'll know what interests people. At least that's what I'm, uh, that's what I'm thinking. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, there was another one that fit in there. Okay, this, you know, you were talking about the Marines. John Rennie. He's a, a leadership uh, uh, coach on, uh, and he posts on Twitter. He said, "Grit." He's got a military background. He, he had a, he was a senior officer of some sort. He says, "Grit is the most important attribute I look for in a candidate. I want to know what difficulties you've overcome." Now, there's a well-known recruiter, uh, Joe, uh, what's Joe, Joe's Marlin, Joe Mullins. He also says he only hires people who have overcome some kind of difficulty. So you know, I was thinking about how do you measure grit? How do you measure grit? And uh, and uh, so it, it, this is a question you would say, I want to know what difficulties you're overcome. Uh, would anybody ask that question? Did you hear that, Richie Rich? I did not. What was the question? Okay. The guy said he's got a military background. He's a leadership coach. He said the key question for him is uh, that he wants to know, he wants to find candidates who have grit, okay? Toughness, I guess, perseverance. And so right away, I wonder, how are you going to measure grit? And he, he gives the clue. He says, I want to know what, what difficulties you've overcome. Would yeah. you guys ask people that? What difficulties have you overcome? In personal life or business life? Life could be business. You're measuring well, grit. I typically, I typically uh, ask uh, to give me a situation with, where they had to deal with, uh, let's say, disruptive tenants uh, or some difficult clients. And I ask to give me a specific situation and what did they do in order to handle that situation? Okay, now so you're, 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 let me cut you off. Your sound is, is getting pretty bad now. So what okay. you're saying, what you're saying is that you ask them, you know, have you ever had a, a tough situation, at, presumably at work, uh, that you, uh, something went off the rails and you yeah. had to recover. Okay. Yeah. I've asked that. In fact, I had a project manager, uh, no, uh, um, uh, IT manager, and he was looking for a project engineer. And he said, you have to ask them, tell me about a time that your project went off the rails and uh, you, what did you, how did you handle it? And he says, if they say they've never had a project that went off the rails, rule him out. He said, I don't believe him for a second and I don't want to talk to that guy. So back to Rich, would you ask somebody, uh, what difficulties have you overcome? Yeah. I mean, it's just, I play sales guys. They got to have, they gotta have great, you just say that, just tell me, tell me about, you know, it's time where things didn't go your way. You know, you lost a deal, you screwed it up. What happened? How'd you get over it? 
you know, or, you know, you, <clears throat> you just couldn't crack into an account. You know, sometimes Sorry, you, I, I guess I'm choking you because you're, you're eating. I should, I should wait till, till your lunch is finished. <laughs> hot, really hot, hot, hot. Um, yeah. So it, it's, yeah, you just, you, you ask them about situations like, you know, like Sasha said, I mean, it's all about situational awareness. Hey, what happened? Why'd you fail? You know, it's not, I mean, every, everyone fails, especially in sales. You fail more than you win. So we fail for a living. Are you kidding me? Absolutely. Baseball, baseball players, right? You know, you got hit, you hit 300, you're doing great. Yeah, okay. that's failed 60, 60, 600 times versus 300 times. And it's a behavioral-based interview question. Rich just asked a behavior-based interview question. That's what employers do all the time. Tell me about a time that a project didn't come in time under budget. How did you fix it? Or tell me about a time you yeah. didn't meet your sales goal. What did you do? I mean, that's just a behavioral-based interview question that you asked to see how they deal with adversity and failure. Okay, hold on a second. There's a difference between saying you know, your project went off the rails and you had to recover it while you were still working on it <clears> and <throat> saying, look. Yeah, what I mean, but, but like in sales, for instance, like, listen, you, you know, you're going to get knocked down a million times. How did you build your pipeline? How did you, you know, get over having no marketing? I work with startups. You know, no one knows who you are. What are you going to do? You know, how are you, how are you going to get, get, you know, get over all the rejection? How are you going to get through and make, you know, get into this crack, this fortune 500 account? You know, it's just simple. So like that gives you an idea, but it could be a life situation too. You know, like, like my son, he lost like 125 pounds, you know, on his own. That's grit. That's tenacity. That's, that's fucking balls out getting shit done. Like, how would, you, how would a recruiter find that out? Hey, hey, hey kid. Uh, do you have any life situations? It's you ask the question, hey, you know, what's you know, what's what's a, what's the hardest thing you've come you've had to overcome in your life? You could ask something simple like that. We can ask those questions that aren't professional. That's what you I want. Would, I would feel very intrusive if I was asking that. But that's why I'm a good recruiter. I feel very intrusive and I'm okay with okay. it. I, just wanted to that, <laughs> I wanted to point that out for a second, though. You know, we, we want we I, I like to identify the things that I can copy that Rich does, like not shaving. Okay. <laughs> wearing a t-shirt most of the time and Thank now you. i find that he likes hot food okay so well, maybe no, i can try that it, it, it <laughs> is just we got a new mic we have a new microwave and our old microwave suck beyond belief and this new one sucks a little less it's the same model because it only fits in the space so it just came out of the microwave so it was hot oh it was it was burning yeah, hot like not, burning, uh, yeah, not spicy hot, hot. Yeah, not spicy. yeah i'm glad i clarified yeah. that for yeah. everybody it's okay actually very good sweet chili okay you know? no no, David M. Marr said something uh, under the uh, under the fold. I don't know what it was. I'm sure it was uh, profound. Okay, so <laughs> if somebody else saw it, please bring it bring it up. Okay, so uh, does everybody hear uh, Rich? Not, I mean, uh, the people who are talking, um, uh, Pistachio. Do would you feel f free <laughs> to ask somebody? Uh, what life difficulties have you overcome? You, I, I can't. Way? I can't say on an open forum what I asked. My candidates. So. Okay. <laughs> Good idea. Don't make me edit it out. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's no problem whatsoever. Yeah, you're not saying, hey, did you have like a major medical issue? I mean, but it's like you that can tell you what they want. You know, I mean, I asking I, someone about their weight loss is a big deal. That's probably uh, you know, that I'm just that was an example. I'm not saying I say, hey, were you a big fatty when you were a kid? I mean, no, it's just listen, what's your big, you know, what was a, something major you overcame in your life that you know, help propel you. Okay. There's a couple of follow-up issues there. First of all, most of the time you'll notice what Rich was doing. He was feeding them the specific difficulties he was interested in hearing about, just in case they couldn't think of anything on the spot. No, saying, no, 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 I'm not. I'm just giving you an example. That was no, all. I'm, I'm, not giving, I'm not giving them the same example I just gave you. Why not? Why not? I thought it was smart. You don't want to, no, because you don't want to lead the witness. That's how you end up with bad candidates. No, you're not. You're not leading the witness. You're saying, what would you do? What? Well, how did you handle this situation? You went into the mart without any uh, clients in this market. What? Did, how did, How would you handle something like that? Or how have that, you handled yeah, that, it? That, you're or, right. That is a good question. And you gave another one, too. What was it? You, you gave about three of them. They were, yeah, it was like. Yeah, you know, but yeah, because this is what I would salespeople. They're going to deal with adversity between how do you build your pipeline? You know, haven't been able to build a pipeline, be able to crack into a Fortune 500 account. How do you compete with you know the bigger players? Have you had to do that? You know, because a lot of them think they can do it, and then they realize, oh, I only know how to sell because I have a Oracle or Dell or you know big name behind me, which okay. means. 
this is what uh, Tommy and I were talking about before. I'm going to contradict what all the recruiters are saying that, you know, you can do be a great recruiter of an engineer like, uh, you know, uh, Doug Ward. He's, he said, okay, David M. Marr, he says, what difficulty have you had to overcome? What was the situation? Okay, it disappeared. Okay, thanks for, you know what? I can't focus on those little messages. Somebody else has to, to read those because I am focusing on the screen, okay? I'm the other people I'm talking to, David Delegate and Mark. Delegate it to Rich. Mm. Yeah, Rich is busy looking, feeding his face, okay? Yeah, and that's my why face. You um, can multitask, though, animal. We're redoing, I, mean, I got emails coming to redoing the Pinnacle website. I, I got you ADHD, you know, you, but you can focus on nine things at one time. Come yeah, on. It helps. <laughs> it's hold, a on a a thing. hold on. No, but uh, Tommy was saying, and the Doug Ward was saying, I've placed uh, engineers with Fortune 5, 100 companies, and I can't even spell engineer. That's not what Tommy said. It's what Doug said, okay? So, but the thing is, if you've actually had functional experience, then you're in a better position to pose those. You can't say what happened with of a project that, that went off the rails. You can actually specify when you've had this kind of situation. Now, uh, then, you know, then I just, if an insider would be able to pick out the um, pressure points better than somebody else, that's, that's my belief, okay? I, I believe it. I, I don't think it's just wrong. I don't think it's wrong. I just think how many of those guys well, most of the time, these engineers don't have the uh, the cojones to ask those tough questions. Is the problem? Okay, yeah. you, you, but you're right. Okay, but I'm saying that they don't have the knowledge. Obviously, uh, you guys uh, think but I'm wrong. Knowledge. It helps if you have the knowledge, like like Ivan. You know, tech recruiter. He knows all about programming. He can tell you if someone's BSing their code. I couldn't tell you when I place engineers. You know, I I don't I don't know their coding ability. Okay, here's a I'm going to switch gears entirely. Here's a question. Uh, that a guy asked me on LinkedIn, he didn't, he said, can you, he's, you know, there's about five people. I post you guys, just so you know, I mean, you, you don't see it. And every David M. Marr, Sasha as well. You guys are on LinkedIn uh, almost every day. Okay. You, if I were you, I would be reposting those things to show off how smart I am. Okay. But <laughs> you're there every day. And, uh, and so this is about, oh, but there's only about five people. There's only about five people who look at them. Look at them, right? And one guy, he he looks, he likes those things every day. He said, "Ask your guys this." He said, "He said uh, my candidate is going to receive a good financial offer, but he's insulted that it doesn't come with a senior in front of the title. Yeah. What, should I, what should I do? Tell him to suck it up, put on his big boy panties, and don't worry about titles. Absolutely." I mean, you got to ask him. And this was the it was what was the pre story to this? Is this guy looking for like a VP role or just what was what was the? I missed the beginning. Of I, it. I didn't give me. He didn't give me a lot of background, so I I don't know. Maybe we're. we're not I mean, you, you get you do get some of these these guys who are like you know title queens, and it's like they need to have the the big fancy title. Some of it is legit for their for their career growth, but more more often than not, I just tell people, listen, eight, and it's true. A lot of companies, HR is like, you know, there's different insurance tiers, there's different medical tiers, there's different things based on your title. So a lot of times, you know, HR, your title is director. On LinkedIn, you put senior director. All right. And usually that suffices and people are fine. I got a client who hires controllers, but they're CFO level. Everything they do is they're, they're running, they're the chief financial officer for a $300 million manufacturing plant. They're over all the financials, IT, human resources, but the title's controller, right? And you just have to explain to the candidate, like I, I've, I've recruited CFOs for them. And it's like, you talk to a CFO and say, hey, the title's controller, but this is the duties and responsibilities and they don't care. And if they do, they're not a good fit for the client is how I look at it. If, if you're so worried about the title, then you don't, you're, you're not, you don't care about the job. All you do is care about, look at me, look at me. I'm a CFO. Okay. You guys sound like you're ready to walk away from this candidate. Uh, because yeah, yeah. But it depends. If this is the guy's big hang up is the title, he really doesn't want the job. You know. What if he's the microwave repairman, Rich? Well, well, then he can be senior poop, grand poobah for all <laughs> Senior <laughs> microwave repairman. Yeah, that's exactly. <laughs> 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 okay okay you guys sometimes it's getting to me with stuff like that i call myself partner i'm the ceo of the company call myself i would never call myself a ceo are you kidding me <laughs> yeah, yeah i know i i always think it's 
pathetic when these I, solo, solo, solo recruiters, the solopreneurs, call themselves yeah. CFO. They're working out of their basement. Yeah, my, I, I'm Dale's an executive recruiter. I have no title, so. <laughs> yeah. Okay, but here's the thing. You know, you guys suggested someone else said, "Look, you, you know, take the title they give you and post whatever you want on LinkedIn." But exactly. When, no, no, no. Just like what you said, with the person is really a CFO, and their but their title at the company is controller. If they put CFO on LinkedIn, and the next oh no, job, they can't do that. Yeah, for that client, so, they can't do that. You're right. No, so there's certain that. there's certain titles that somebody mentioned internally that HR has that in their HR system, so and so is a level one, and the title translates to I don't know, director, but they're really a VP. We're performing VP duties. So there's functional titles and then there's professional titles. So what I tell people to do is, you know, if your if your internal title is um, X, but if you talk amongst your peers, you would you would call it Y. List Y, not X. You know what? I wasn't good at algebra, so I've lost a track of what you're trying <laughs> trying to say, David and Mark. Okay. What so could you put out, yourself, out, 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 out. Let me guide you, okay? I'm guiding what? you. No, you're not guiding yes, me. You're, I, I you're misguiding you. me. That's you're misguiding me. What no. can you put on? You want to fight with me? What can you put on LinkedIn? <laughs> if he just said, if you're a title <clears throat> controller, that my, my concern is when you go for your next job five years from now, the next employer is going to say you're a liar because you're putting a different title on LinkedIn than you've actually got with the company. They check a reference and mm -hmm. say, this guy's not if a VP. If you use the title that uh, that would be recognized by your peers, where it's not like a false title, right? Like you can call yourself a recruiter, you can call yourself a town acquisition specialist, you can call yourself an executive recruiter, you can just put yourself as an HR person, but you're still a recruiter. So you can put it however you want to articulate what you're doing. And if you're talking with your peers, they're going to know if you call yourself this, that's what it means. You can call me anything. Exactly. Just don't call me Jackson. They're getting caught up in titles, and, and I, I don't know. To me, though, that's there's the candidates I don't want to deal with. And if they're so caught up in titles, a prima donna, I, yeah, yeah I, I don't want to fucking deal with them. <clears throat> well, it's like when I get like business development is like the worst title in sales because it means something to every company. Every some company BD means you're inside salesperson. Some means you're a, uh, an SDR. Some people you're a channel person account executive so it has no connotation because it means something different to everyone so i always tell those guys change your title you know make an account executive or whatever the hell you actually are um you know it's not it you, your skill set is the same your job is the same but by saying your business development it doesn't tell you anything i have companies that regional manager means you have a team of five sales guys over a region and i have clients whose regional manager means you're a sales rep in a region yeah. right it, it's it's and, and honestly, and if the company doesn't hire you because of that, they're not hiring you, period. Mm -hmm. You know, well, this guy's, no, this, in this case, the guy's getting an offer. He's getting a good offer, but he's he's a title queen. At he's I a prima donna, him. yeah. <laughs> but hold on a second. This comes back, Rich. Before you were here, Tom and I were talking about uh, Libby from HR said the worst kind of employee is the one that nobody likes. Uh, uh, but they're so good at their job, you can't justify getting rid of them. Okay. And so now he, to Tom says, look, I don't want to deal with candidates like that who are, you know, getting upset over a title, but Tom, they might be really good at their job. It might be impossible to say no over, over, uh, over their, their fussiness, whatever. Although that's I, on I the client. that's on the client. That's on the client, right? You gotta remember, we can't make deals happen and we can't blow deals up. What do you mean? It's always our fault when people don't work out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, until they don't work out, then it's our fault. Yeah, come on. Remember all those commission checks you get when some, when your when your people make a ton of money and they. they <laughs> the, I but mean, I mean, hey, Rich, it, on on his question, how do you feel? Like we were talking about this, um, the best. You know, you have a you have your top. You you in a recruiting firm? You have ten recruiters. Your number one recruiter is billing two million, but he's the biggest asshole. Treats all the employees like shit. I heard of him. And, that, and that's and that's a hard thing to do, though, is, when he's bringing you in a million dollars. And the other guys are only bringing you in 200 grand. You either tell the guy, you go work from home, do your thing. Either way, he's just going to destroy the rest of your morale. That's what I happened mean, to our my old company is exactly yeah. what happened. They would not fire a toxic employee because he was a million dollar biller and he drove the whole company down. Yeah, I mean, dude, listen, I, I, I have a friend. They had a company where one of the recruiters literally broke up the owner's marriage, you know. And 
you know, it, it, it got passed down to the next generation years later, like years later. All right. Like, you know, five, 10 years later, whatever. And they still kept that person on. And then finally, they're just like, kind of woke up and they're like, what the fuck am I doing? <laughs> like, this is ridiculous. Everyone, same thing. Everyone hates this person literally destroyed my parents and her family. And, but they're yeah, like, I mean, funny. they refused. He had sexually assaulted people's wives. Oh, he sure. lied, stole. He got the, the owner's son beat up in a fight in Miami stadium. And they wow. still, but he was billing a million for a million five. And, you know, we only got half, less than half. So this yeah. guy's bringing in 600 grand pure profit. Yeah, but you know what? It, 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 it makes when you got a toxic environment, it, no one else produces. Exactly. And, and, and people quit over it. Good six hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand dollar recruiters quit over it. I stayed, yeah. but three or four guys who were billing four or five hundred grand all left. Yeah, why would you I mean why would you stay and put up with that? I mean, at any company you shouldn't stay, but especially yeah. at a recruiter firm when you can go walk and do your own thing. That's crazy. Okay, but you know what? You guys had it a little twist, or at least Tommy did, because I was talking about someone who's just unpleasant. You were talking about a Harvey Weinstein, okay? So uh, <laughs> it's a different story. But uh, well, David, I, there's, like, there's levels of unpleasant. If he's just a dick, but he doesn't make a toxic environment, then that's one thing, right? You could deal yeah. with that guy. We're talking about guys who make a toxic environment for the team. Libby said you can notice when that person leaves that things are much better. And she wasn't talking about someone who sexually assaults people or even harasses them. OK, so but I, I, I want to take a step back. David and Mars are regular here and I wouldn't want I shut him down for a minute. I want to see if there's something you had to add that I didn't cover when I said I was going to speak for you. David and Mar, the floor is yours. You want to say something? I know you're passing notes all the time. <laughs> That's because I'm doing multiple things. Um, like a so good with, with regards to toxic people, I've worked in multiple environments where, um, where you had, uh, someone that was very good at what they did, but they let their pride or entitlement get in the way of, of their, of the, uh, way the office worked and it did take its toll on the morale. And I think the correct thing to do is to either carve that person out into their own area or you have to, you know, ask them to move on basically. Okay. But you know, as, as Tom said, there's sometimes it's a, it's a tough, uh, tough line to walk. Okay. Changing gears. Okay. Jordan Peterson, everyone who knows he's the most famous Canadian in the world uh, probably or what for a little <laughs> while. Okay. He says, okay. he says people, people who, uh, you know, downgrade small talk, are just really stupid, okay? And I know there's a, a whole slew of sourcers, you know, who say small talk is terrible, I don't believe in it, blah, blah, blah. He, what he say, he says, people who say, I don't have time for small talk, it means I have uh, no social skills. And he says, they don't understand something really obvious. People are <laughs> not gonna bear their hearts to you the first time they meet you. They're gonna test the waters, you know, with something trivial to see how you respond to that. Before they get a little more serious, I like the way he said it. it was a very short uh, YouTube. Probably short. the first time I ever agreed with that idiot, and he's a hundred percent. I don't even know who he is. I've never even heard of him. Oh, really? He's a. Uh, <laughs> he's a. You work for me. How you have it? You have it. But he's he, a psychologist, um, college professor who uh, says things that strike the Canadian elites the wrong way, and he's uh, basically gotten disbarred or something like that, and had lawsuits against them. And he's oh, on, he uh, always he's on some talk show. Guy. I can't remember the name of the talk show. He likes to cry a lot and he gets hooked on benzos. <laughs> oh, yeah? Well, he's not the guy that's always protesting and like leading, leading those rallies and stuff like that. No, no, no. He's, a co he's a collegiate type person. He's yeah. a very smart guy. He's actually extremely extremely intelligent. He has a very yeah. good academic background, but he got Wears three piece started suits all the time. Farts way too many, too much. But okay, that let's, what he's, let's focus on the content you're making. What, that, what he said, I said that. He, what he said and by the way, he's correct. not the most famous Canadian. Justin Bieber is. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> he absolutely was 100% right. That, that uh, you know, small talk is social skills, right? We do that when you recruit a candidate. If you can't um, kind of mesh with them and, and talk to them about more than just, I'm recruiting you for this job then you're not going to connect with them. It's a relationship. You're trying to, you know, I get, I get on the phone with these people and at the end of the conversation, I know how many kids they have, where they went to school, what they're doing this weekend, like what sports they like. It's, it's a connection. People don't give a shit how much you know till they know how much you care. 
Yeah, that's a nice cliche. If you go to exactly. a party, Steve, you, Steve Levy wait, always says wait. that the most important thing in recruiting is the human element. Absolutely. And if you remove the human element, then we're then we're just AI. Then our jobs are gone. Yeah, that's and exactly. That's the key. So <laughs> small talk is something you have to learn how yeah. to do. Yeah. Granted, you may not be good at it. I know sorcerers that I, 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 don't like to talk to people. Yeah, but I, but I, was, I know sorcerers that know love to talk to people. I was just on a on a mar I was talking to this marketing company early this morning, and one of their email lines that they used was, you know, it, it just they do three short like three line emails, and it was Max, and one was just say, hey, I noticed you were still in uh, whatever Huntsville, Ohio. Is that the they they just pick a random like local pizza place out? Is that two two Italiano place still there or whatever? You know, it was my fave. And you know what makes it's great opening line for for a quick email. Hey, you know, is this a working on this search? I don't know if something you you know you or your buddies put up. I forget the rest of it, but I, it's a it's a great small talk opener. Like I said, I the Food Network has gotten me made me more money. Than <laughs> from, from and that is, and when you said that the other day, Rich, I was blew my mind because I never thought about that. But I do similar stuff to that. But to realize like how you can really take the food stuff and use it as small talk is even better because it it connects them to their town. Yeah. I mean, like, literally, I mean, who's been to, like, you know, whatever, nothing Ohio or whatever, whatever part of the world yeah. you're in? What happens when they find out that you've never been there either and you're just conning them with Google or Google yeah, Map? Yeah. I don't yeah. say that, number one. Number two, I would say I saw it on Food Network or I've heard yeah. about it or my friend went there, right? If I did go there, I'm going to say it, but I'm not going to say, oh, I had dinner at the Ocean Grill in Vero Beach, Florida. It yeah. was fantastic. Do you go there often, right? If I'm yeah. somebody in Vero, I'm not going to say that unless I actually went there. Okay. Just so uh, Rich you gave an example earlier that um, um, a manager decided to hire a candidate who, you know, loved rugby. Isn't what? that a small talk? What small talk? Yeah. Well, you gave an example er earlier where one of the managers uh, preferred hiring a candidate. Well, look at Bobby. I, was, I was just going to take that up. Let me do it because I, my my voice is clear. Uh, Sasha's uh, at, at the gym on the treadmill right now, Rich. Okay, so that's yeah. what she's yeah. okay. But we were talking what she's referring to. Look at what Tommy has on the screen behind him. I love you more than rugby. Okay, but in fact, Gavin said. He had three candidates go out to a company. The weakest candidate, it turned out, he loved rugby, and so did the hiring manager. So the hiring manager picked him, even though that Gavin really didn't think he was the best for the job. Okay? And why was I telling you that story? What were we talking? Oh, yeah. I, I can't remember. Small talk and how that related to him hiring a candidate that maybe wasn't the best on paper. Yeah, had okay, the most we, experience, but he fit in culturally. Had, they had something to talk about because of rugby. But if you go to a party and you meet a bunch of people you've never spoken to before, what are you going to do? Start talking to them about, uh, hey, do you like rugby? That's what I know how to talk about. No, a good small talker can pull any topic out of the thin air and start. Did you, uh, hey, did you never see Curb Your Enthusiasm, The Midler? The yeah. Midler look, if you go into a party or there. go to someone's house, look around, see what yeah. they have on the wall. Look what they've but, done. See what who, they collect, who, what they're into, and then yeah. use that who, as your talking point. But if your LinkedIn profile sitting up, I look at where they go to school, what they do for fun. Yeah, I mean, it's easy. Watch, go watch Curb Your Enthusiasm, the whole episode dedicated to this topic. Yeah, the you think, do you think Larry David would be a good recruiter? <laughs> <laughs> you know, case in point, I got a guy that accepted a job uh, Sunday, okay? And him and I were talking, and I sent him pictures of my setup. Because we were talking about the kind of computer he was going to get, he told me he had two monitors and he loves Macs. So I set him my setup, and he's he's Google Gaga and all over my setup. We connected on that, right? He wanted to know all about my computer, my screens, and yada yada yada. And that was it. Was I? All he said was, "I have a Mac." Okay, thank and you, I, Rich. Rich gave me a clip to, to that. So I'm going to have to watch that episode and come back and talk about it. Don't yeah. be a bad middler. Okay, I must be missing something from my brain though, because I, I, I am no good at that. You know, saying, "Hey, what do you think about the atomic bomb? Should they have dropped it in 1945?" You know, I mean, like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's really that's a great topic to bring up out of the middle of nowhere. If you're standing yeah. in line. Ask him why, why yeah. Civil War started over slavery. Why don't you, for Christ's yeah. sake? Well, yeah. listen, next time you're at the grocery store, next time you go to the Piggly Wiggly, there, just turn around and ask the person next to you about the atomic bomb. <laughs> Well, hold on, Rich. How do you? I forget. How do you use the Food Network? How's the Food Network made you made you money? 
because you like we just said all these restaurants you see them on like triple d or whatever and just like you know all these dump these diners whatever and the guys you're calling a guy like outside of cleveland and like dude have you ever been to you know whatever joe's taco truck or whatever and it's like it looks amazing so you don't have to say you've been there you say, it looks amazing i've been there whatever i mean i travel a lot so i've been to a lot of places but it's 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 an incredibly great icebreaker bitching about your spouse and food two best topics <laughs> Rich, I tagged you in a post online uh, for a potential client for you. Oh, I love you. Thank you. Okay. We're still I'll say, I can't complain. And even if I, someone say, how are you? I can't complain. And even if I did, my wife wouldn't listen to me. Yeah. Right? Like, <laughs> I say stuff like that and they laugh and we start talking. Like, yeah, you need, it, it's, it's, I don't know. That's why we're recruiters because we can small talk. Because we can talk that to, to anybody. Would you say that to a woman? Okay. Oh, uh, this yeah, is my wife. Yeah. No, no, you wouldn't. Oh, no. Oh, no. No, you wouldn't. I can't complain, and no one would listen anyway, even if I did, not even my wife. That is not misogynistic. That's just saying that no one gives a shit about me. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. That's called being a husband, you know, and a father. <laughs> just that, that is the reality of our life. I can be right or I can be happy. I can't be both when it mm -hmm. comes to being married. Okay. We've got uh, <laughs> we've got eight minutes left. Does anybody have an issue? Like <laughs> Anybody got an issue, or, or should I keep uh, pressing on with with my yeah. wonderful <clears throat> Tommy on the uh, on CNBC? The, or I think it's CNBC. Mr. Wonderful's on uh, talking about uh, if you you and your wife differ financially, have different uh, views of financials, basically oh, view money differently. Talk about it. good Valentine's Day topic. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 oh yeah. yeah. Oh boy, yeah. Oh yo yo, that's right. Uh, tough okay. day. Okay. Uh, no, well, you know what, uh, Rich? Just in case you need to add something to your repertoire, Tommy and I thought this was great. You ask for everybody you talk to. You say, "How'd you get hired here?" Have you ever asked that? Oh yeah, yeah. This was great. I never thought of asking this. It's a great question. I, I have. I don't ask it all the time, but it's a great question now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. We all agree on something. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> the. Uh... Hang on. What do we think? I'm trying to see if my camera looks any different. <laughs> it's very important. This is on full. All right, you can tell me. And then uh, this is good good stuff for the show. The <laughs> I was complaining I look pasty, and I adjust, tried to adjust myself to look rosy-cheeked before I came on. Yeah. There you go. Does that look, any, does it look better? It doesn't look any different to me. It doesn't look any different. It doesn't yeah. look any different to me either. But Rich is let's, – let's do a plug. Rich Rosen. America's recruiter has now has his own podcast. Do you have a yeah. URL for that, Rich? Uh, I, it's going to be scale up. I I, I got to check it. Scale up with Rich Rosen, I think, is what it the, dot com. Um, but I haven't put it up yet, so that's coming this week. Yeah, we've been waiting for this for nine months. I know. Um, but I did it. I used up my first one. Yeah, listen, it wasn't a piece of artwork, but it was good, pretty good for number one. The only thing I coached Rich, I uh, where Rista offending him. Here he always looks at the camera when he's doing his own interview. He's like, I know. I know, I, you know what? Because I, I had the camera too high, and it was like, here I'm too low. Like I'm way too low. I got to move this picture down. That's what I got to do. Okay, and you also have to tell your your uh, interviewee, tell him to adjust the camera like I always to yell at you guys. So his face, he was sitting his way back there, you know, <laughs> at the other side of the room. Okay, that was that far back, but I hear you. It was, but yeah, you know, I thought you know what you can give me your honest opinion for the first uh, first one content wise, it was okay. It was pretty good. Rich, you've got the gift of gab. Does anyone ever praise you? Okay, Ivan praised you more than I did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> he wanted to move in with you. I he never had an okay. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah. I used to be a bartender. That was the greatest yeah. training for me to become a recruiter on the gift of gab side, right? Oh, I could yeah. talk to anybody. I could start conversations. I know how to deal with different types of groups of people. I know not, not what to say, you know, politics, religion, all that. Yeah, I, that, that, my, eight, six, whatever years as a bartender and a waiter and a bouncer in Disney really, really helped me become the recruiter that I am today because the way I can talk to people. At Disney, you were a bouncer at Disney? That's really funny. <laughs> <laughs> but you're not a tall guy. No, you don't need to be a tall guy. You just, I've got to remember too, I'm only dealing with occasional drunks and, and if any fight broke out, I would just grab a guy and go, if you hit me, you're going to jail and I'm going home to sleep with my girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> you leave now, we're all good. And that usually broke up everything. 
Keep a baseball bat under the bar? No, 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 no. no. I think you're not a real bouncer. <laughs> <laughs> I've been hit twice as a bouncer, and once was by a woman because I was throwing her husband out. I had him <laughs> around, I was lifting him up, and she came up and started punching me in the ear. <laughs> that, that's like, you know, and then I got hit by a guy one time, and then we threw him out. That was it. Most of the time, yeah, you just walk right, right out the door. How did you get hired here? I beat up a lady. Beat me. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hit her. Never touched her. <laughs> okay. Well, you know what? Here's, yeah. a, here's a good question, but I think maybe we should save it for next time. This guy was recommending that with your clients, when you're doing a pre-close, say, can I accept this offer on your behalf? Okay. I don't like that at all. Do you guys Last do that? MRI close? That's like an old MRI close. Yeah. <clears throat> a lot of people say, still do. go ahead, Rich. Go ahead. No, I was just say a lot of people still do it. I, I don't even bother anymore. It, it's uh, you know I, I before they go to the final, you know you know when, if it's coming, you you, you want to get them closed, but listen, they got to accept it. You pre close early often. If they offer you eighty thousand dollars, you're going to resign tomorrow in like two weeks. You just keep saying that from the time you talk to them to the time they get their offer, and that's mm -hmm. about the best you can do, right? But, okay, you know, I don't know about you guys. I don't know what the, if you guys noticed the problem. And David, this would be good to get your opinion. Because you got these internal recruiters who don't really keep you fully involved in the process as much. It's hard to stay on top of the candidate because you're kind of left in the dark a lot. The internal recruiter wants to do everything. And so you a lot of times, like the last few months, I've noticed the last six months, you know, the amount of time you just you're losing not the I hate the term candidate control, but you really have got to stay on top of your crap to have that candidate interaction because these internals want to cut you out. On purpose or not, I think it's more because of their dumb databases that they use. But um, you know, so it's tougher and tougher, I find, to keep people in line and keep them tight to a process. Unless you, I mean, every morning I now have my first like thirty, uh, my first like seven. I have at seven thirty to eight. It just lists everyone that's interviewed every day. I just move them over daily. That way, you know, every day to check in with these people. Otherwise, I get too much going on. I forget. You know. I, so, I lost control of a guy because it took. It was a very long process, Christmas, yeah. New Year's, and everything, and and they had a couple of interviews, and then there were some things, and the candidates, you know, gainfully employed. He, he wants to make a move, but he's not looking, and it, I lost complete control. I they made him an offer yesterday. I had no idea. But then you control. lose. But as a recruiter, you lose interest when you don't have that interaction with the candidate. Yeah, I and lost I, interest because I didn't know that they were going to move forward. Yeah. It seemed like they were. They had stopped. And then all yep. of a sudden, hey, Tom, he did great in the interview. We're going to get him his assessment. Hey, his assessment come back. We'll let you know what's going on. And then, boom, they made him an offer. So yep. I'm like, oh, shit. I, I, and I, half the time, it, the offer doesn't close, I find. You know, no offense, David. The inter if the internals are handling it, most of these guys are junior, not senior. This wasn't even internal. internal. I just gave up on it. And the engineering manager has been handling it since. Yeah, see, that's funny. And it's crazy because no matter what you do, you I mean, I always coach these camps. You always got to call me after every interview, no matter what. Like, text doesn't do it. I need a call. And, you know, if they only text, I, I assume you're not that serious, you know, but it's so hard to stay on top of people when you got so much else going on. Yeah. No, no one outside of those of us in the business realize that all the candidates don't realize that you, they think you're just waiting on them. Which and you want to also spend time on stuff. You, like, I'm not sure this is ever going to close. So I'm spending stuff on time that I know is going to close. Right. Like, yeah, if that happens, great, wonderful. But I got to get these deals done. And this, you know, I got this for catering, yada, yada, yada. And then all of a sudden I get a call yesterday. Hey, we made him an offer. Yeah. What's better than that? Rich is saying the opposite, though. OK, like he said, those don't close. No, because I got no control. I can't help yeah. him it, through the process. It, I didn't yeah, know, overcome they, anything. They can close. They can't close. But they're not satisfying because you had nothing to do with it other than you're like every other putsy recruiter who flipped well, the resume. Over. Not, when you're on your yeah. way to the bank. OK, when you don't have to call. It, I'm not knocking it, but I'm just saying you can't rely on it. It's it's a it's a slippery slope. I'd lose my mind if I had to work like that on every job. I yeah. lose, I would think wouldn't do this job if I had to do that. Yep. I quit. Yeah. I've worked I'd go sell cars or something. <laughs> when I've worked for a few companies where I had to manage the agency relationships, if a hiring manager chose to uh, partner with an agency, I would try not. I would make sure that the agencies that we were going to partner with knew what the process was, and basically I would allow them to run with it, right? Because at the end of the day, you want to be closer to the hiring manager so you know what's going on with your candidates. But I just had to make sure that you that they followed the process that we normally followed, um, which was ignoring recruiters, giving no information, no feedback. <laughs> no, <laughs> well, you would be working. You would be basically working directly with the hiring manager. I would just be like kind of in the background, so I had you know, or like a project manager, right? 
Yeah, yeah. you're overseeing it, but you're yeah. not working on the sir. I mean, it, it always right. you agree with you, Rich. Give yeah, in. No. You agree with people, you. When people, <laughs> when these internals give you, you get it. You get a retainer. And then they can sit, they can't <coughs> with you on the search and they don't want to talk to the manager. It just, it's like, it's so counterintuitive. But if you have a retainer that makes absolutely no sense internally. <laughs> you know, I'm about to, I'm about to lose a deal next week because I have a retainer and, but somehow their cans magically came in first and where I got interviewed before mine and somehow they're, you know, the lead dogs and everything. <laughs> I'm like, okay, whatever, you know, your and choice. on that sad note, everybody, even yeah. though it's Valentine's Day, you you got you brought me down, Rich. Oh, uh, sorry. I, hey, oh, listen, it's not gonna feel bad. Even Rich loses. You know, it's just that you know, this <laughs> somebody is succeeding in the world. It gives me hope. Okay, but when he's telling me sob stories, so how do how am I gonna feel for the rest of the day? <laughs> hey, we all lose. We lose ninety percent of the time, man. That's yeah. that's. What well, we you do. know what? Thirteen minutes. I have a new client calling me, so it's all right. Okay, Rich. He's trying yeah. to cheer me. Trying to cheer me up. I am. I was cheered up to know that Wonder Woman uh, does fitness routines three times a week to stay strong and look at, and looking like the real thing. Okay, with those uh, medallions. There she is. See, she's Rich? still walking. Jesus Christ. Hey. For you. <laughs> you better listening to the recruiting animal show while you're doing your exercise. You can take your mind off the pain. Thank you, Sasha Kasanovich, the great Tommy Pistachio, Alasio, America's recruiter, Richie Rich Rosen, and our favorite internal guy, David M. Marr. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.